All right, let's get started. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this webinar. Um, today, we have Michael Moffat here with us. He is the Executive VP of Data Marketplace at CO3. And we're going to be discussing how we can go beyond GPS data and more towards advanced logistics data and load tracking, and more specifically, how CO3 is doing this. Before we start, we've got a couple of housekeeping points. Uh, the chat function has been deactivated in this webinar, so please be sure to post all your questions in the Q&A function, and we have saved 10 minutes at the end to be able to answer them. So without further ado, I'll hand over to you, Michael. Thanks, Bianca, and uh, welcome, everybody. I appreciate you uh, taking time out of your busy day to uh, learn a little bit more about the industry that you work in and, and some what's currently facing the market and some of the progress that's happening uh, in this market that I think is offering some very exciting opportunities, uh, not only to optimize the supply chain, but also really target issues that are specific to each supply chain. So very happy to speak with you today and, and let's go ahead and get started. Um, as Bianca said, I'm the executive vice president with CO3. Uh, we are a data, data marketplace that specializes in advanced road freight logistics data. We're a preferred partner of Sender and, and a company that we've collaborated with uh, for a couple of years now. So I just want to get started by giving you a little bit of info on, on myself and, and so you understand better who's presenting and, and where I'm coming from. Um, as probably most of you can hear, I'm originally born in the U.S., uh, but I've been living here in Europe now for uh, close to 15 years. Um, I spent about 12 of those years in uh, France and uh, just the uh, past three years here in the Netherlands. Um, very much like living in Europe and, and like to call this home. Uh, I have about five years of uh, Army experience as well. Uh, it spent some time in the French Foreign Legion and Engineering Department, and then got my first exposure to logistics and, and the field in general in the Army, uh, spending about three years there doing troop movements and, uh, and, and different logistics uh, techniques and, and uh, projects for, uh, for the Army. After that, I kind of had a natural transition into uh, logistics and supply chain overall. I got my first start with a company called Expediters that was doing 3PL logistics uh, in various functions, uh, starting out in sales, really learning the ropes and, and understanding the intricacies of supply chain and some of the issues that was facing it. Uh, eventually went on to become a district manager uh, and ended up uh, my last two years there looking over the risk management and customs compliance for the EU, covering about 40 different offices in, in 25 different countries. Uh, and then uh, I had the opportunity to move here to the Netherlands to join Uber Freight and was part of the team that helped launch the, uh, their European branch, uh, working with them and really getting a, a very detailed understanding of marketplace dynamics and really getting more into the technical side really how to leverage data, especially in a company like Uber that you know creates masses of data, understanding how to leverage that data and what you can do with that visibility uh, really to improve your overall processes and, and reduce cost. Uh, and then I had the fortunate chance once we sold our uh, Uber Freight branch to Sender to work with Sender for two years. Uh, there I helped dev uh, develop their uh, spot marketplace and uh, in, in, in a scalable spot marketplace where we grew that to uh, nearly 50% of the company's revenue. Um, and in the last six months, uh, I've been taking I've taken on the uh, the challenge within CO3, uh, essentially to shift the business model, and, and we'll go through that and why that's so important to advance logistics, uh, but really head up our data marketplace business development overall, uh, and speaking with different customers and companies on on ways that they can leverage this advanced data uh, to help with their supply chain. And then most of all, I think uh, what's more relevant to this is, is just in general, I'm a tech enthusiast. I'm the co-founder of an association called Tall Project, really an education of awareness of advanced technologies and, and trying to understand uh, some of these more technical things and, and really uh, bring them down to, uh, to a level that, uh, that uh, you know, any sort of person can understand. Um, and uh, you know, with that, I've put, in, put on uh, more than 200 educational seminars uh, around technology and logistics itself. So uh, hopefully this will be a, a very good and interesting and informative uh, uh, time for you all. So getting started, you know, before we start talking about advanced logistics uh, data, we really need to talk about the current market. When we're talking about visibility and IoT, um, just to kind of get started for anybody who doesn't know, IoT is, is uh, actually represents internet of things. These are connected objects. 
uh, that are connected to the internet that provide data in various ways. So that can really be anything that's connected to the internet. Uh, but for our uh, use and purpose, we will be talking about the IOTs in vehicles and in trailers, uh, which we typically call telematics devices uh, or um, uh, GPS uh, signal devices as well. So to kind of set the stage, I'd like to talk to you guys a little bit about what's currently facing this market and some of the challenges, but also some of the positive changes that are happening that'll help us lead into this conversation about uh, not only tracking GPS location, but what other kind of data sources are out there that can help me have a better understanding and visibility of my supply chain and really start to make concrete improvements in that supply chain, either to increase optimization, reduce costs, or understand really the impact, whether that be carbon emissions uh, or uh, infrastructure issues that are currently existing within the EU. So to get started with the market challenges, um, I think this is a, a very important one to highlight. Um, you know, like I said, I've been in the industry for a little over 10 years now. Um, and unfortunately, the conversation that I've had with, with shippers and, and with receivers over the last 10 years uh, in relation to GPS has been exactly the same. Uh, you know, 10 years ago, I was speaking about it and we were talking about the exact same challenges, the challenges of a market that's expecting 80, 90, 95% tracking rates and data and an industry that continues to produce very marginal tracking numbers and really sitting around a one out of two or two out of three sort of tracking uh, data. And so it's important to understand the dynamics that go into that and why it is so challenging to get the real-time visibility that we need. So the first one is, is really just very fractured markets. And, and I think anyone working in logistics uh, has a good understanding of, of some of what I'm speaking about here. Um, but one of the ones that's typically not known is the fracturation that we find as well in IoT and telematic device providers. Uh, within the EU alone, there are hundreds or thousands of different companies that are providing the small devices that are aftermarket. These aftermarket devices are typically offered or given to carrier companies that own assets for them to plug into uh, their trucks and trailers aftermarket to be able to provide GPS to the services that they are offering. The problem with this, though, is you end up with a thousand different companies, a thousand different companies that all have varying degrees of data. They also have different ping rates, different uh, data structures and nomenclatures, as well as API connections and documentation. So it makes it a very laborious project to be able to upkeep this, to be able to contact all of these uh, various providers and to aggregate everything in a way that makes sense and is usable for the end user and customer like shippers and receivers and even 3PLs. Now, on top of that, there's also hundreds of visibility providers. So, you know, all of these visibility providers are trying, uh, really trying their best to aggregate all of these third party IoT providers. So not only do you have a ton of competition between the hardware providers themselves, but you also have an immense amount of competition between the companies that are providing this uh, data and analytics and visibility overall. And so what you end up with is a lot of companies that are in their corner that are handling a very small piece of the overall market and really trying to push and, and enforce that people who are getting this GPS tracking are doing it specifically with their platform. And so you create a lot of competition and very little cohesion in a market that's already very divided. And then lastly, I think this is gonna be evident to, uh, to really anybody in logistics is, is just the overall market fragmentation in logistics. Um, you know, it, it's talked about often in our industry, but I think uh, rarely known where you have the top three 3PL three providers in road logistics in Europe that own less than 8% of the market share combined. And so even the largest companies out there that are really trying to make change, it's very hard to change the world when you're only seeing two or 3% of it. And so these are a lot of the challenges that are facing us and how we're able to obtain that data, how we're able to gain data consent and how that data is able to be transferred to the end user. Now, on top of that, this data, unfortunately, has pretty low quality, and it goes to some of the things that I was speaking about before, whether that be each company providing its own device, each device has its own specific data that it shares, it has its own specific ping rates, so that can go from 
a data point being shared every few seconds all the way up to 15 to 30 minutes without a lot of variation in between. Um, it, there's a lot of difficulty as well navigating all of these IoT providers. These are typically not large multinational companies. They tend to be smaller SMEs, national companies that have a very specific focus within their country or region that they work in. As I was saying before, one of the hardest things and, and really is something that's difficult to, to, to convey is the complexity of the data structure. Having all of these companies provide these different data points and different nomenclatures creates a lot of work in the back end for engineers to be able to translate this data, find the same nomenclatures throughout these hundreds of different providers and ensure that it comes in in a frictionless way that's usable and readable for the end user. And then on top of that, you know, when I speak to a lot of customers, I think one of the biggest frustrations that we see is they're investing heavily working with companies that are trying to provide GPS data and tracking. They're working with companies that are trying to give them better visibility, but we end up with, unfortunately, a lot of manually entered data. And that can be by the shippers themselves, that can be the three PLs that they are working with who are trying their hardest to provide supplemental information to the GPS themselves. But what we're getting though is manually entered data means data that is not correct and typically not automatically driven. And so you end up with instances where people and humans can do things that are in the best interest of their companies or themselves to try to ensure that the customer is happy, where really it creates a lot of confusion and also uh, as we say in, in, in data and in data structure, garbage in, garbage out. And so the result in the analytics of what you come out with are only as good as the data quality itself going in. And then on top of this, I've spoken about it a little bit, um, but really one of the things that's, that's plaguing the European uh, um, supply chain market and especially data is multiple, multiple layers of subcontracting. It's a very opaque landscape with chronic subcontracting, and it's built that way to be opaque for a reason. This opacity creates a lot of opportunities for companies to use subcontractors, as well as other companies, smaller SMEs to exist at all. It gives them the opportunity to work with larger companies that have access to bigger shippers and bigger enterprises, while also not having to handle all of the administration and work that goes into speaking with and dealing with large complex customers. Now, the issue with that though, is that typically a shipper will think they are working with one company. Now that company is probably subcontracting to a Spedition or a third party company that's also a 3PL. They'll typically subcontract with somebody else who will then hire the end carrier, who's typically a one or two truck owner uh, that's coming out there and really just trying to keep their truck going. And so the end result of that is you're speaking with one company for data consent and GPS visibility, but the end user that can actually give GDPR consent is typically two, three, or four layers deep within the supply chain. And so that gap really creates a huge gap in communication and the ability to get to the end user and the consent giver uh, based on GDPR rights uh, here in Europe. Now, the data consent, as I was saying, has to be given not by the contracted party, but by the asset owner themselves. Now, this is through GDPR to make sure that we are protecting the company themselves, as well as the individual human person who's actually driving that truck and would be related to the individual data points themselves. While this can be challenging for business, it is very good for the people who are involved in ensuring that we're protecting the data of individuals and companies that need to be protected. And then lastly, again, going back to what I was speaking about, just the difficulties in connecting to these subcontracted parties, not only understanding who that in subcontracted party is, who is really operating your freight, picking up your freight, delivering your freight and handling it throughout the process, it can be a very difficult process to get to that end uh, user and to be able to obtain that consent overall. Now, not only are there not 
there's not just bad things that are happening in this industry. Unfortunately, there are a lot of positive things and, and we're getting a lot of movement and momentum in the right direction, right in time and really aligned with a lot of the initiatives that are happening here within Europe and within each country within Europe to really try to have a better understanding of the supply chain, the issues within the supply chain and infrastructure issues that might be causing bottlenecks overall. Now, one of the craziest things that we don't often talk about is the connectivity rate overall. And, and I'll go into this in my next slide as well, but the great majority, 95% of all trucks and heavy vehicles that are on the road in Europe today are actually connected to third-party telematics or telematics devices and currently producing data. Now, we're not getting all that data and I'll go as to, in, into why a little bit later on, but it's incredible to see how much data is being produced versus really how much data is being used in a way that can be beneficial to companies and be leveraged for change. Trailer connectivity is another issue, but it's also something that is starting to ramp up and becoming more uh, of a positive change within the industry. Uh, trailer manufacturers were a few years, if not a good decade behind the game in terms of understanding the connectivity of their trailers and offering data of status of the, the transports and the trailers themselves could be beneficial to the shippers. Now, fortunately, your largest trailer companies in Europe have done a very good job of transitioning. They're really ramping up both production of their trailers, as well as the IoT connectivity to be able to show some incredible data that's very specific to your merchandise and the transport itself. And then on top of that, OEMs in general, so your OEMs, your truck and trailer manufacturers, your Scania's, Volvo's, and, and MANS and DAFs of the world, uh, really have put an extra accent on the connectivity of their devices. And for the last 10 years have been producing and installing their own devices into the vehicles and the trailers during production. So this really gives us the ability to not only have one tracking device within a vehicle, but sometimes two or three within the same shipment, giving us multiple opportunities to collect data in varying ways uh, and data structures. Now, probably one of the bigger drivers that we see right now is governmental and structural support. And, and this is really what is driving so much of the innovation and the change within our industry. The European Union, the European Innovation Committee and European Commission have all recognized and understood that there are many different black holes and areas of opacity within the supply chain that are making it very difficult to have true impacts and to redo infrastructure that's going to be needed to simplify things within the future of the EU supply chain system. Now that has come with a massive amount of investment, not only private, but also public investment. Part of the horizon uh, uh, investment and, and, and project that was passed during the COVID days, there's over 100 billion that's allotted for innovation and data, data uses, data sharing and supply chain optimization. So we really feel that this puts us as CO3, but also the actors within our industry in a very good position to be leaders within this innovation and leverage our technologies to really help the European Union as well as the companies here find true solutions to some of the issues we're facing. And then lastly, there's a very strong market demand. Um, you know, all of us went through two years of COVID. We went through sitting at home all the time, ordering everything from our groceries to our toilet paper to our Amazon at home and receiving emails of, hey, your delivery is gonna be there tomorrow at 3 p.m. And sure enough, within an hour or two, somebody's knocking on your door and you're able to track door to door. Now this has actually gone up from the individual as we've come out of, post, come out of COVID into large enterprises that are saying to themselves, hey, if I can you know, order my groceries and see that they're gonna be delivered on time, why can I, as a large multinational company, not do the same? And so it's creating an enormous amount of demand, not only for the visibility in, an, in a product offering, but also to their end customer, trying to give that better visibility so they know what's happening, reducing overall engagement and operations between the two companies and hopefully streamlining things overall. Now, again, going back to the EU issues that we've had, what we're finding is there's lots of infrastructure issues within the European Union, whether that be roads and infrastructures, bridges, there's a lot of stuff that's being done, or research that's being done right now on infrastructure on refueling stations and electric uh, electrification and hydrogen. 
the European Union is really focused on trying to make sure that uh, not only our road structure, but our rail structure is set up for road transports and last mile deliveries within the European Union, uh, really trying to fix some of the chronic issues that exist uh, since before the time of the European Union itself. And I think lastly, you know, really the big thing is a lot of the surveys that have been done in the European Union showing that over 80% of companies believe that having GPS tracking is really a minimum to even start working with companies like yourselves. Unfortunately, as we're seeing, it's really not holding up to, uh, to its name overall. So kind of what is this problem? And, and just a recap of what we were talking about. As we were saying, we have about 95% connectivity. And, and this is a bit of an anomaly and an issue when we're thinking about what the output is versus what data is actually being created. Going back to what we're talking about, your expectations are 90, 95%. The connectivity is there. So why is it that we're having so many issues? And the issues are pretty bleak. You know, when we look at visibility overall, the European Union estimates that only 8% of road transports within the European Union are actually tracked end to end, leaving a huge gap in understanding of where things are, what are the conditions and what are the issues. On top of that, because of this, this lack of visibility, you have a lot of empty rates, estimating that almost 30% of, of kilometers that are run within the EU are run empty. You know, we talk a lot about capacity issues and driver shortages and, and things that are going to be facing the market now and also in the future, where we really have a lot of margin for error to be able to reduce this empty capacity, to optimize that capacity and make better use of the assets that we have through visibility itself. And then on top of that, unfortunately, we see a lot of companies that through this chaos are not able to really use the capacity that they have. Not having an understanding of when these trucks are coming, where they're going, or what are the condition means that a lot of companies are using uh, their trucks and FTLs a little bit like an LTL. We're seeing fill rates of about 50% right now. Um, so not only are we have a lot of empty miles, but the miles that are being driven with freight uh, are not up to uh, the full capacity that we could use. So what is this? We call this at CO3, we call this the data gap, right? And this is, I'll just kind of go through a brief one here, but just to kind of recap, the first one is the subcontracting. Again, you're dealing with a company that most typically is not the consent giver for the data that you need, but often has two or three layers in between to gain access to that data. And then the transfer of data back also complicate, uh, complicates things greatly. Telematics fragmentation, as I already spoke about, having that many companies, that many API connections, that many different uh, nomenclatures makes it very, very laborious. Low access and, and, and low quality of data overall, not understanding you know, if all the data points are coming in, when they're coming in, and under what uh, condition. And probably one of the, the, the bigger issues that we're facing that a lot of companies don't speak about is that there's very little value for the carrier and for the, the consent giver to share their data. These companies are typically offering this as a way to participate in a tender, but are typically reluctant to go the extra step and to make sure that their visibility is always visible and that they're providing the needed data to see what's happening. It can be advantageous for carrier companies not to show their data all of the time, and ensure that they have a little bit of wiggle room to run their business the way they need it to be run. And so really adding some carrier value and, and a reason for them to engage with it is going to be a very big part of the future going forward and having this data available. So what are some of the market advancements overall? The macro advancements like we talked about, one of the big ones that's happening both in IoT, but also within the logistics sector is consolidation. Now, consolidation in a lot of markets is spoken about pretty negatively. People don't like the idea of consolidation and companies buying other companies. But in an industry that is so fragmented, the biggest players are only 2 or 3% of the market, frag or, uh, consolidation is necessary. We need a bit of centralization within this organization so that we can have a better visibility, not only of the supply chain, but also the actions within that supply chain overall. Another big one is data cooperation. This is really the number one word that I'm hearing, not only in the European Union, but also within uh, competitors and, and, and companies that we work with in this industry. 
cooperation, cooperation, cooperation. Uh, within the supply chain and the logistics industry, there's been a large worry about anti-competition and working together and setting pricing that really created an industry dynamic that everyone was in their specific corner. And a lot of shippers that we work with, they'll work with multiple providers to not have all their eggs in one basket. And while hedging your bet is worth it and makes sense, you also have to think about what is the end result and am I really getting the benefits out of the variable selection that I have? Now, governments and trusted institutions, as I've spoken about a lot, are major, major drivers, not only in the European Union, but across the world. We're seeing it in the Middle East, we're seeing it in North America, we're seeing it in Africa, where countries are starting to understand that the infrastructure and issues that they have are really at the heart or root cause of many of the supply chain problems we have overall. And they understand they need to be a driver of setting up the right institutions and the right laws and regulations that make a lot of this consolidation and data sharing necessary. Increased investment, again, private and governmental are coming in, continue to come in and will continue to come in between now and 2030 as many objectives around sustainability, carbon emissions and overall changes within the market are happening. And then really one of the big things is, is battling the shortage, right? Increased use of available capacity through sensor technology, because as we know, um, you know, being a being a driver, being a carrier in today's market, and really over the last ten or fifteen years, has been a very difficult job. There's a reason that there's a shortage of drivers and a shortage of interest from younger individuals, because it's a job that's very laborious. It tends to go on for weeks and weeks. People aren't able to see their families, to be home. The living conditions are not great. They're not always treated the best within the sectors that they're working in. And so really trying to optimize through technology, a lot of technology is coming around now with autonomous vehicles. So much of this is gonna be driven by the data and the quality of the data we have overall. And then there's also macro, uh, micro influences, sorry. Uh, sustainability is a big one. Um, you know, any company that I speak with and really just about any kind of company under the sun now and, and government institutions, when I speak about advanced data, the data we can have and, and what's available in the market, uh, what we find is the number one thing is, ah, sustainability, CO2 emissions, NOx emissions, how do I hit my goals? How do I hit my promises for 2025, 2030, 2040, 2050? Uh, but also tracking your cargo. Um, you know, there's, like I said, the OEMs, both truck and trailer are investing very heavily in not only providing the right type of data, but providing data overall. These companies are starting to see a little bit what I would call the Tesla model. Really the idea and understanding that the data that these assets produce is just as valuable as the asset themselves. So really a transition in business model and understanding and the way that they can leverage this is pushing this forward as well. And then with that, with this, this investment that's coming in, this fractured market that's coming in, it also leads to a ton of innovation. So you're seeing a lot of companies that are log tech innovation companies. They're coming out to provide you know, specific solutions, customized solutions or marketplaces overall to be able to leverage technology and simplify things. And so through all these companies that are starting up, you're having a compounding effect of innovation that's starting to happen as these companies collaborate. And then again, battling the shortage is not enough to, to talk about it once or twice. Uh, these are chronic issues that we are facing and going to just get worse over time, making sure that we're leveraging our data uh, to use this and, and, and really this available capacity is going to be huge. Okay, so now that we've kind of set the stage on, on where we are with the market overall, a lot of what we talked about is you know, the fracturation, the data that's being sent, uh, the issues that we have with the opacity. The, the other thing that I typically find with, uh, within logistics and the supply chain, and when talking about IoT, is that most companies and most individuals think about IoT, they think GPS position. Where is my freight? When is it going to be there? And when is it over, right? They want a way to easily communicate with their end customer without having to invest in overhead in people and in individuals to do this manually. So much of logistics now is about reducing cost, increasing efficiency, 
and reducing cost again. Now, the interesting thing about this is most of these third-party telematics, they provide very basic data, what we call GNSS data. So this is stuff like GPS position. It can be the speed. It can be the direction that the truck is pointing in. It can be ignition status, so you know whether that truck is running or it's off. Uh, but other than that, it's typically about the full gam of data that they provide. Now, what we've done and what we're looking at uh, with NCO3 is we see that you have OEMs that continue to invest very heavily in their own IoT and telematics. They're investing very heavily in having the same data structure for all companies that are producing. It's called RFMS data structure. Uh, really to simplify everything, make sure that all the devices, no matter if it's a Scania or a Volvo or a Renault or uh, a, Schmitz Krone, uh, a Schmitz Cargo Bull trailer, that they all have the same data structure, same nomenclature, same ping rates to really facilitate the data and make sure that everything is as frictionless as possible. But what we're getting from these that's very different and very specific and something that's going to be an innovator in the future is advanced data. Now, these IoT devices, since they're not third party, not only do they track GPS and direction and all the things I was talking about, but they track every single data point on both the truck and the trailer themselves, as well as the connectivity between the truck and the trailer. Now, with that, we get a wealth of data that can not only help us understand where things are, but also understand the conditions, the environment, and the status of those shipments and that freight overall. And so you get some very interesting things, like you get that tracking HD, the ETAs, uh, you know, that are very typical to a lot of GPS services. But there are some interesting things that we can start doing with data, like understanding the tackle graph and the remaining driving time that a carrier has, the brakes that they have, the temperature monitoring within a vehicle. So if you have something that's refrigerated or under certain conditions, we can understand temperature and humidity, uh, doors opening, right? Axle weight, understanding if your truck is loaded, unloaded, is it being loaded, is it being unloaded? When were those doors open? So to have indications and steps and triggers within this data to allow you to understand exactly what's happening, when it's happening and what the real conditions are. And then on top of that, you get things that are very important to so much of what we're facing in the future. As I was saying before, sustainability is on the tip of everyone's tongue. And so when we're talking about sustainability, it's understanding the entire impact of your company. And what we find is the supply chain typically is a very big chunk of overall carbon emissions. And also one of the key areas that we have that we can leverage our understanding and actually create a change that'll have impactful changes and results on our overall carbon emissions, not only uh, with each individual company, but as a collective, as a region, uh, and as the European Union. So we're able to, uh, to track things such as fuel consumption and the level of fuel, the speed, the acceleration, the driving style, the engine type, emission class, as well as CO2 emissions and NOx emissions. So by understanding these data sets, how the carrier's driving, where they are, what are the conditions, are they braking too often, how are they accelerating, really enables us not only to calculate CO2, but really to have a very detailed understanding in carbon emissions by the kiloton of, uh, of CO2 produced or NOx produced. So many of the companies that we work with that we provide data to, the, uh, the idea is, is taking these um, sort of European Union, the, the GLEC and, and estimations that have really been a baseline for our understanding of overall carbon emissions, we're able to use this very precise data to refine those calculations, to create a new baseline understanding of true carbon emissions, and to help each company understand where are the key points and areas within their supply chain that they can have a true impact and the largest reduction of their carbon emissions overall. So going beyond the GPS data is really what we're talking about here and, and leveraging the wealth of data that's being created. One of the most uh, impactful, I, I think, uh, data points that I have seen since, since I've been working in this is the OEMs uh, are producing masses of data. And, and it's, it's really hard to uh, overestimate the amount of data that they are producing. Now, the 
the most successful OEM is able to sell about 8% of all their data, meaning 92% of data that's being created just from OEMs is going completely unused, stored, stocked somewhere, uh, and not really able for anyone to leverage that data as we should. And so what we've done is by, by uh, working joint ventures with these OEMs, we're providing a way for them to not only monetize their data and find uh, a way to, to be able to, to take advantage of the data they're producing, uh, but really to set up a collective and a sort of consortium that allows us to pull in multiple, multiple uh, uh, OEMs uh, and third-party telematics to create a database that's going to be uh, sufficient for companies to have a true understanding of their relationship and for us to work with companies like Sender and others uh, who are really providing the tools that are needed uh, for companies to have uh, not only the understanding of what's happening, but operate their logistics in a very streamlined way and with as least and, and, and uh, reduced overhead as possible. So one of the big things that I face in, in business development around advanced logistics is uh, when I speak to customers and to companies, uh, there's a lot of interest in advanced data, but since it's not something that's been spoken about uh, very often within the industry, and, and also because it's, it's something that's a little bit ahead of its time, we typically have issues of, uh, okay, well, I'd love more data, but what do I do with that data, right? What, what are the use cases? What can, what benefit can I get out of this? And so I just kind of want to address a couple of different case studies that we're currently working on and putting together, uh, both with Sender uh, as they are a major partner of ours and also the European Union and Commission, as well as some of the work we're doing in the Middle East that'll highlight some of the use cases that this advanced data throughout time will be able to do uh, for you and your supply chain overall. So the first one, again, going to carbon emissions, not a secret, uh, it tends to be uh, the main subject that we're speaking about uh, with every customer and, and whether we're working on multiple projects or not, this tends to take the lion's share of the attention and the investment itself. And obviously for a great reason, this is not just a logistics issue. It's not just a, a Netherlands or European Union issue. It's, a, it's very much a global issue. So I'm glad to see companies are investing there and putting attention to it. Um, but what we are working on here is really using CO2 measurements and, and sustainability showing the impact of biofuels versus diesel. Now, I know that this is a huge initiative for Sender and their sustainability team. They have a great team that's working on multiple calculations, both at the European Union and many different associations like the Smart Freight Center, for example, who are all working as a collective to be able to have a better understanding of carbon emissions, the infrastructure that's needed going forward to increase the use of biofuels and electrification and hydrogen that are gonna be really the propellers of the innovation and change going forward to reduce our overall carbon emissions and have a more sustainable logistics future. Now, the problem though, is that the, you know, Europe's leading digital freight forwarder. So again, uh, Sender is investing very heavily in sustainability, uh, really trying to work with customers to find alternatives to using uh, diesel fuels and leveraging already existing biofuels and biofuel infrastructure to help companies across Europe, either directly fuel with HVO and biofuels, or to be able to leverage the amount of biofuels that they are consuming uh, in the form of credits as well, uh, something they call HVO Flex. And so we found that this was a very interesting case study for us as well, not only to measure the carbon emissions through our data, but also to show the true impact of using biofuels versus diesel fuels with very limited investment from the asset owners themselves. So we feel that there's a very promising way to go about this and, and want it to be a big part of this project overall. And so what we had start to work on and what we would propose uh, is a few different things. Now, the, uh, one of the big issues that we have within uh, data sharing and overall data within uh, the European Union, as many of you know, is GDPR. So we have a couple of different ways, not only that we can work with and within the GDPR framework, but also we're able to leverage our data on a massive scale, very large advanced data sets that are anonymized that help us get a better picture and understanding of what's happening within the market and within each vehicle without revealing the unique identifier or the individual themselves. And so this is a very interesting proposition for, for both sender and a great way for us to leverage this uh, data and show the value that's in there. So via these large anonymized advanced data sets, 
what we did is we worked out the specific areas and regions and as well as the data points that were relevant to this. So again, sort of your fuel consumption data, your distance uh, in, in kilometers, the average speed that's being driven, the OEM CO2 emissions data, as well as one factor that's typically not taken is the gross axle weight. Now, when we see most calculations of CO2 emissions, what we tend to find is that the CO2 emissions are an estimation plus an estimation times another estimation and a little bit of guesswork and you come out with an average, right? And it's great that we have an average, but what we're finding is that this average because of estimation plus estimation tends to be considerably higher than the reality itself, which also is very good news as we start to refine this and have a true understanding of what those are. So through our data, we're able to show if the truck is full, to what point it is full, what is the charge weight, and that's a factor that we can add in to the overall fuel consumption and CO2 emissions to have an understanding of what are the fill rates, when a truck is full, how much carbon is it producing, when it's empty, how much carbon is it producing, and then within a supply chain, you can see, all right, well, my carbon emissions are X instead of Y because 30% of the time my providers are running empty. The other 70% they're running with freight. Out of that 70%, maybe 50% is full. And so really getting a true fine definition of the overall carbon emissions, helping companies reduce the overall amount of investment that's needed to understand that, as well as giving them a true picture of what they're facing and what that impact is. Now, the great thing that came out of this and, and through the work that uh, the uh, Center Sustainability team did, and they, they really have some great uh, data analysts there and, and, uh, and some people that are, that are doing some amazing things with uh, their various calculations and, and standardized settings, is that we were able to reduce by 16% the amount, the actual amount of biofuels that were being used, reducing the cost for both sender and their shipper uh, by about 16% overall. So not only can we show a reduction in overall cost or overall carbon emissions, we're actually able to provide a cost reduction to both sender and the shipper themselves by really honing in those numbers and giving a true definition. And now 16% when you're talking about, you know, the millions that are being invested by certain companies and, uh, you know, across the European Union can be a very sizable amount. And so these are the sort of things that already uh, in the very beginning days of, of leveraging this advanced data that we're starting to have an impact on overall uh, cost reduction and optimization as well as uh, what's happening under the carbon redu uh, reductions overall. And probably one of the better things that came out of this is this is leading to other groups and associations that are looking to uh, be a part of this and to have an understanding of how this calculation method works and how we can leverage this calculation method uh, for other uh, associations and groups within the European Union that are tasked to understand this on a more European level. So this is a, a one that I was very proud of and, and I uh, like to continue to work with uh, Cinder on. I think there's some big things coming out of this. Now, the other one is uh, around EU infrastructure and data sharing. As I was speaking about before, the European Union has leveraged about 100 billion uh, specifically for data sharing, not only between companies and different actors within the supply chain, but also between EU member states, right? So there's, there's fracturation that happens within the industry, also within the European Union, that really makes this very complex. And so we've teamed up with uh, Alice Group, the European Innovation Council, uh, Mosaic Factor, CHEP, PNG, University of Antwerp, Rotterdam University, Transporian, just to name a few, over 30 different actors in this. Uh, and what we're looking to do is leverage advanced data sets and 24 seven real time tracking to explore future infrastructure needs, CO2 emissions, and bottleneck areas within the European Union that need to be addressed by further investment between now and 2027 as a way to speed up and simplify the European logistics and supply chain network. So the problem state is, you know, as we were talking about with COVID-19, you have really exposed many, many points of failure within the supply chain. In the 10 years I've been doing this, I have never heard logistics and supply chain more on TV, more out of the news. I think the, the major sign was when I was speaking with my mom, I had been telling her for probably a better part of seven years what I was doing and she wasn't really understanding what was happening. And, and then I started getting phone calls from my mom. Hey, don't you work in logistics? Don't you work in supply chain? And I was just, I was blown away that, you know, even to that point, 
uh, it had been mediatized and advertised and, and really come to the, pu the public forefront. Um, and so the EU logistics market, they highlighted a lot of need for improvement, both in real time visibility to understand what's happening uh, and also data sharing across the states, as I was talking about. So with the driver shortages, you have between 20 and 30 percent empty kilometers. You have aging infrastructure. The European Union Innovation Commis uh, Commi Council sorry, developed the Hot Horizon Grant uh, to spark innovation and find solutions to our current challenges. And so what we did with this proposal, uh, we worked with, uh, like I said, 30 different companies and research institutions collaborating. It's an 18 month innovation project. It concerns nine different pilots. So everything in from infrastructure to innovation, bottlenecks, CO2 emissions, as I was discussing. Uh, and the idea is to be able to leverage this data to get an image of what's happening and address the supply chain issues today that are going to be plaguing us tomorrow through real-time data and advanced packages. And so with this, we had some, some very specific data that we're using leveraging. Uh, this is stuff like GPS position, again, so a basic data set, but also a very, very important data set. We can talk about the speed, so understanding where infrastructure bottlenecks can happen, the axle weight, are these carriers moving empty? Is there a way that we could better leverage capacity within the European Union? to address specific issues instead of have this be independent companies that are, that are each addressing their individual supply chains. Dwell times are a huge one. Uh, you know, many companies are working with third-party logistics companies who work with third-party warehouse companies who work with, there's so many different layers. And so really a lot of opacity, understanding where these carriers are, where they're sitting, what are the emissions and, and when, under what condition, as well as driving style and doors opening. So these are ones that we feel that we can really give a very good photo of where carriers are, how they're being used, how we could increase the efficiency and make better use of our capacity overall. So um, I'm going to end it there. I know this is a lot of information, um, but I hope that this gives you a little bit better image of, of some of the things that we can do with advanced data going on. Absolutely amazing. I'm completely blown away. I've learned so much today. <laughs> but thank you so much, Michael. Unfortunately, we are at time, so we're not going to have any uh, opportunities to answer questions. Um, yeah. But I did see one come through in the Q&A. Uh, we will absolutely be sending out this deck and the recording. Um, and if you do have any questions that you would like us or Michael to answer for you, please feel free to send them through. Um, Mike, I don't know if you've got your email address maybe on the next slide. Uh, or, um, I don't actually. We'll, we can uh, send that out with, uh, with my LinkedIn as well so that uh, if anybody has any questions, they can uh, feel free to reach out. Amazing. Okay. Well, in that case, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it and have a great day, everybody. Thank you so much and thanks all.